Hey, ain't you Jim from Morro Bay Fishing? Yeah. What can I do for you? Well, I thought I smelled a skunk. Don't you get skunked every time you go out fishing for lingcod? <laughs> Yeah, as soon as I ran out, I got that's funky. Perfect color. We barbecue up a trike. <laughs> Deep, even though we had it sauce on it. I'm heading to a spot I found last summer in my uh, video exploring Montana de Oro. This is a little spot so beautiful, I call it fishing heaven. And I believe I have an excellent chance of catching a lingcod. Why would I have the audacity to think I could catch a lingcod? Because it's early November. You know what that means? That means the lingcod are coming and the females are going to spawn and the males are going to come in and protect their egg. It's about 6 a.m. High tides at 9. It's a two foot swell day according to the reports and the swell is rising. If I'm going to get that lean cod, I've got to do it pretty darn quick. As I walk by to go fix this, uh, rehook this piece of bait properly, you can see that is a very big piece of jack smell. Once I got there, I realized I didn't really know how to rig up such a big piece of bait. The jack smell was much bigger than my hook, so I decided to take a flay out of it, and that would have made it thin enough for my hooks to get through. That left me a piece with the head on it, and another piece I'll use later for backup. But that only gave me two pieces of jack smell to use as bait, although they do stick to the hooks pretty darn well. But I was thinking that a large piece of jack smell, or one that's almost like a whole fish, would give me the best chance at targeting a lingcod. But do me a favor and let me know in the comments below how you think I should rig up this thing for my best chance uh, to get a lingcod. I've been casting this bait for 15 or 20 minutes here, so I'm... Uh, pulling it out to put a little scent on it. The swells have been too big uh, for weeks to fish. I was so excited about this swell dropping and actually giving me an attempt to get out here that I was here before the sun even came up. You can see the rock that's out in front of me, the little tip of it there. I'm casting just to the left. That's what I'm targeting, just to the left of, of that rock in front of me. Obviously, if you cast over it, you have a pretty darn good chance of getting snagged. It's real easy to lose a lot of gear in this area, but I've noticed, yeah, just to the left of that rock and out there a little ways, that's where I've caught most of my fish here. If you go too far to the right, you're going to get a whole bunch of snags too. Kind of a, a V-shaped little sweet zone right here. Check out these bites right here. Those are some pretty big tugs. Then we get a big old strike. Boom! Sadly, we missed it. I definitely think that was a lingcod. I think trying to set the hook like that was a mistake. I should have been more patient and just really let that fish take it. As you'll see in my next video, perhaps. You saw me playing with my camera right there while it was biting, and I noticed it wasn't on. That's why we only have this angle for now. It took my bait. That only gives me one more piece of jack smell. I'm very disappointed I missed that. I, I thought that was it. You can tell. That's why I'm shrugging over there. By the way, that jack smell is uh, from uh, my last video. The one I did, the Fisherman's Life bobber, I had that left over uh, from catching the two. I could use that bobber system here. This is my other piece of uh, jack smelt. You can see I'm putting the number six hook in right at the top, and a number six hook down at the bottom, and that's probably where I should have had a nice treble hook instead of a number six hook. The way that thing was fighting, I thought it was the link cod. There you go. It's my last pit of jack smelt. I'm hoping the big old link cod out there is going to want that. I should have caught a couple more now, since it's such good bait. Right now it's pretty easy to get over, uh, get up on that rock, but if, once the tide comes up a little bit, it could tougher even with a low swell, because, you know, just basic that part goes underwater. water. 
It's such a beautiful morning over here in Montana de Oro. I did a good job casting a, into the same spot and started getting little nibbles almost immediately. Then the swells start coming in a little bit, and that kind of always messes up the bite. You gotta kind of hope the fish is just staying there, but they usually don't bite when the waves are coming through. The bite stopped there, so I decided just to pull the line in a little bit, and then boom, we start getting bites right away. Fish on, baby! We're just hoping it doesn't run down the hole. You can see the pole, it's, it's shaking its head. This is a nice little fish. It's fighting very well. And you know, I'm thinking right now, oh yes, oh yes, it's gonna be the lean cod. It was a grassy, a nice grassy, but still a grassy. Grassies do put up a really nice fight. I mean, as opposed to brown rockfish. So I can see why it can be easily confused with the lean cod. And catching anything is preferable to being skunked. Despite my disappointment in not catching a lean cod, this is a very nice grassy. If you watch that fish closely on the way in, you'll notice he spits out my uh, last piece of jack smelt. Right there. Just, I, I, I'm going to reuse that piece, but nope, gone. No more jack smelt. Okay. Got the nice little gopher here. Looking pretty nice. Not that big. I was able to get the hook out of it, so uh, I think we're just going to go ahead and let it go. Little fish like that, hey, my Jack. Luckily, I brought a whole bunch of squid, so we'll head out there and give that a try. You can see the tides are rising and the swell's kind of picking up there, so I got to get to it. <laughs> When you're in a situation like that, you know, just gotta brace yourself. The swells aren't that bad. You know, just don't panic is the most important thing. It is the reason I always wear uh, uh, surf socks and sandals out there. And surf socks keep you warm and the uh, sandals drain faster. I'm casting just like before, just to the left of the big rock in front of me and probably 40 yards out, 35 yards out. And reel in a little bit, tighten up the mine. I gotta tell you, the coves of Montana de Oro, they're just beautiful. It's just, you just gotta go, go down there and take a look. This is about a half hour later. You can see the sun's coming up and I started getting these little bites right here. Now uh, you can see they weren't very big, and, and then they just stop. Better pull it in and check the bait. And the bait is gone, which is why the bite stopped. <laughs> getting pretty sloshy out there any bigger swell we wouldn't be able wouldn't be able to stay there and then I get a snag and it's not just any snag this was so stuck I had to break I had to snap the braid. It usually just come off on the leader, but for some reason, I guess it was bent over a rock. I had to pull really hard to get this thing to break. I had a 50 pound braid on there.
As I said, these swells aren't that powerful. But what I'm really afraid of is just having them splash over my cannon and have it run even worse than it's been running all day. rock I want to step on is underwater so I gotta wait till it clears. And then the tide's coming in and the swells are picking up so I'm thinking it's about time for me to move on over. I think I'm gonna head over to the next reef over and try over there. Otherwise I'm just gonna get washed off this rock. That's the rock I was on and this is the one I'm going to. Looks a little more protected hopefully. As I'm walk walking up there I notice the kelp heads floating out there. Yes, so it's kind of a nice place because you know it's like 10 or 15 feet right off the front of that rock. On the other hand, I've lost a lot of gear here. There's just some, I, I haven't found the sweet spot as far as this area. I did catch a uh, grassy here. In fact, I, I think we're going to eat it in this video. A little surfing turf at the end. Yeah, we didn't get any bites, but here's me lose a, losing more gear. Watch this. So is this is my typical La Ligne that got away story? Well, in some sense, I guess it is, except for one problem. This isn't the end of the story. This is just part one. After this, I do head over to the South Jetty, and I do catch a whole bunch of jack smell, and then I take that over, and I guess you'll just have to wait and see what happens on my next video, which has already been shot, and I'm working on it right now. Well, I can't say I'm not disappointed I didn't get that lean con. On the other hand, I'm going to go on home, burn me up some tri-tip, and fry me up some fish. going to be tasty. Came out this morning looking for the lean cod. Caught a nice gopher over on the other side up there. Didn't really get any bites out here at all. I was kind of bummed. Lost a lot of gear. There's a whole bunch of rocks and stuff over there. Just going to have to learn about that one. I did catch a gopher over there, I think, a couple videos ago. I was really hoping to pick up a lean cod over there. Boy, got a really nice bite this morning. Did manage to pull out a gopher. Didn't take it home. Probably should have kept that. But uh, beautiful morning. Going to hike on out and see what we can find on out here. All right. Yeah, as soon as I ran out of jack smelt, I kind of quit getting bites. So I think we're going to have to get the old kayak out, cross over, and get like, you know, 10 of those babies and pack them up for uh, bait this year. And that's what right. I did about a week later. Rolled over to the South Jetty and picked up like uh, eight or nine jack smelt. Gonna go try those, see if I can get a link card. The sand was alive with sand crabs last time I went surfing. Now off to cooking! Today we're gonna barbecue up a tri-tip and uh, fry up some fish and have a little surfing turf. This is what a tri-tip looks like in your grocery store. Some parts of the country don't have them, but on the central coast of California, this is a beloved steak. Now when I say a blackened tri-tip, I don't mean it's going to be blackened because we put a lot of spice on, spices on it and fry it. No, I mean it's going to be blackened because we're going to roast the heck out of it on a barbecue. We're going to develop a black bitter crust that is delicious and the first part of doing that is to go ahead and put a whole bunch of salt on that. You saw the other side, this is the fat pack, fat pack side of an untrimmed, untrimmed tri-tip. This is my beat up old Weber, had it forever. We're going to uh, start by putting coals on one half of the surface because we're going to roast there and then on the other side that's where we're just going to let it cook. We're going to light up them coals and then come back and check it in about 15 minutes. These coals have a little black around the edges, probably another five minutes or so. You can see I've got them real close to the grill. That's perfect right there. Gray, got a lot of stuff left to burn. And just throw that tri-tip right on there. We're going to let it sit there for seven minutes and burn. And burn some more. And burn some more. And finally, burn some more. <laughs> and then we're going to flip it. 
And after we flip it, we're going to let it burn for seven more minutes. Just let it flame. It's a very big piece of stick. It's not going to hurt. You'll be surprised. Head in. Watch your favorite show there. Frodo! Okay, so after we burn the heck out of it on two sides, we're going to flip it over fat side up and put it over here on the second half of the grill and just go ahead and put the lid on it. We're going to let that cook uh, for at every five minutes or so. We're going to come out and check the temperature. The, the fact that the tri-tip is on fire is hilarious, but that's what you want. Okay, it's about five minutes later. We're checking it. Go right down the center. Looks like we got... That's more done than I thought. This is the 118. Once it goes over about 120, I'm going to pull this thing off. I'm going to put the lid back on, come back up, and check it in about five more minutes. I don't want to wait too much longer after that. Here I am checking it again. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, that, that hit 121, so I'm just going to put the lid back on while I run in and get my pot. I am taking this thing off right away. We're going to go put it in the kitchen and just let it uh, rest for a while. Don't put a lid on it. There's a lot of heat within the uh, tri-tip itself, so it'll keep on cooking. We don't want that. I don't want it to go over like 125. Okay, it's been resting for about 15 minutes. I just wanted to show you what it's right. And look at that. It's perfectly medium rare. And notice that the, you know, it's not like burnt deep, even though we had it right on the fire, right on top of the coals for almost 15 minutes. Here's a nice still shot that shows you the, the perfect color. And then those little burnt ends right there on top of my fish and my crusty fish. You've seen me fry fish before, so there was no reason to do it again. So let's get this thing taste it. You know, I use this still because the camera gets so much better color contrast than like an action camera, GoPro. Now back to the regular camera. That's Kraft uh, original barbecue sauce. I don't like the flavored yeah. stuff, just original, nice and sweet. Good to you can see it has a really nice black crust. <laughs> Goes great with the contrasting sweet sauce. Now let's go into those uh, burnt ends and put a little sauce on them. You can see they're very well done. But again, with that crust on there, it's just a bitter, yummy. And with the sugar, oh my God, I love it. You should try it. Try some of this fish, which you know it's going to be good. Needs a little. Mm. Yeah, I notice you're going right back mm. for the burnt end. Not the, the rest of it's really great too. Max, I got to take this and go get me a coke. Sit down on the couch and uh, watch some Fisherman's Life. <laughs> Thank you.